السلام عليكم الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد الرسول الله أشهد أن محمد الرسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلا حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إن الحمد لله <تصفيق> إن الحمد لله نحمد ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يحده له فلا مد الله له من يدلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبد رسوله أما بعد brothers and sisters I'm going to start and be straight to the point. We're surrounded by negatives constantly. We watch the news and all we hear are negatives. We're surrounded by fitna. We're just, we're forced into a spot where we are just questioning where's the good? When's the last time that's any of you, that any of you have uh, watched world news and you've heard a piece of good news? You know, hey, as a matter of fact, uh, in Africa, there's something good that happened. No. All we hear are negatives. And what that does to us is it breeds this, it breeds this helplessness within us. It breeds this hopelessness. SubhanAllah, there are, even, there are even people who say, you know what? Yomu Qiyamah is close anyway. There's no point in even trying. Yomu Qiyamah is about to happen, you know. Imam Mahdi is going to come and save us all. That's it. You know, things are only going to get worse. What's the point in even trying? We're hopeless because we're constantly convinced that we need to be hopeless. So, I want to start by saying that first and foremost, I'm going to be a little blunt here, but if you found yourself in any of these categories, including myself, this is an insult. This is an insult to anybody who has ever struggled, who has ever strived to procure a better future. 
By you saying you're hopeless, you're basically telling everybody who is striving and struggling through, no matter how hard their predicament is, you're telling them that there's no point. How could you tell a slave that lived after being shipped over the Atlantic Ocean without receiving a morsel of food, how could you tell them that, you know what, segregation is going to continue until the end of time anyway, there's no point in even trying. How could you tell millions upon millions of brothers and sisters who are crying because they don't have anything to eat, they're trying to survive in drought. How can you tell them that there's no point in even trying to survive because you know what, no one's going to donate at that fundraiser. No one's going to donate to charity. You're not going to get any food. What's the point in even trying? How could you tell our brothers and sisters who have been born into destruction and all they see is war day in and day out, how could you tell them that there's, you know what, <laughs> Yom Al-Qiyam is close anyway. Imam Mahdi is going to come anyway. You know, there's no point. Things aren't going to get better. There's no point in even trying. How could you tell that to these people? So my question to you all is, how can you convey that hopelessness to them? Now, I will say, hopelessness is a natural emotion to visit. Hopelessness is a natural emotion to visit, but it is wrong to dwell on. We can take an example from the Prophet Wasallam's life. The year of sadness, as we all know. He lost his be beloved Khadija radiallahu anha. He lost his beloved Abu Talib. And what's more, he didn't even die on the name of Islam, on the word of Islam. And on top of all of this, what a terrible year for him this is. What happens next? He goes to Ta'if. And what happens there? Two miles. Two miles. Now in the Olympics, you'll find that there's a 100 meter sprint. There's a 200 meter sprint. But is there any such a thing as a two mile sprint? Can you imagine running for two miles being pelted consistently by rocks? As a matter of fact, the companion that was accompanying him uh, withstood a, a fracture to his skull because of how bad and how painful this was. Can you imagine running for two miles? But what happened next? This was the point in the Prophet ﷺ life where he was at the lowest of his lows. Things couldn't get much worse for him. He had every reason to be hopeless, but what happened next? This is symbolic, so pay attention. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? He brought the Prophet ﷺ to him. The night journey. Isra al waraj Excuse me. Isra al miraj He brought him up to him into the seventh level of Jannah to meet him. Now, obviously, we're not going to get that chance until the Akhirah. But what does that mean for us? When we're hopeless, we need to find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we're hopeless and we're like, you know what? There's no point in even trying anyway. That's the time when you need to say, I have Allah. And that's the time when you need to become closest to Him. Right, I know. Easier said than done. However, inshallah, we need to figure out ways to do this. Now, I'm going to give one more example of somebody who has found Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he had every reason to be hopeless. He is not a prophet. He, his name is actually Abdullah bin Hudhafa. Now, this is during the time after the Prophet wasallam's death. And it was during Umar ibn al-Khattab's uh, caliphate. And during that time, there was a great expansion. They were going into Rome. They were going into Persia. And there was uh, a battle between, a small battle between the Romans and the Muslims. And this small battle, the Muslims actually, they lost for that small battle. And the Muslims were brought in as prisoners of war. They were brought in as prisoners after the war was over. The Roman king... Abdullah ibn Hudafa was actually part of these prisoners. So the Roman king actually catches wind of this. He hears, oh, one of the uh, companions are with them, huh? And at this time, there has been a rumor. There was, uh, he hears that, you know, the story of the noble companions. The people, he, he actually even, na'udhu so, billah, he believes that they had some sort of gene, this DNA within them that gave them powers that made them demi-humans, demi that, that they, weren't, they were only part human, that it elevated them above regular humans. Okay, so the Roman king figures out, oh wow, one of the noble companions are with these people, bring him to me, bring him to me. So the guards bring him to the king. And the king says, he, he wanted these genes, he wanted this DNA within his family, so he says, you know what, you know what, I'll let you marry my daughter. You can marry within the ro royal family the Roman royal family. However, all you have to do is convert to Christianity. 
Just leave your religion. You can marry my daughter and you can come into the royal family. I'll treat you like a king, everything. You're a prince. Abdullah bin Hudhava says, no, I would, I'm not going to relinquish my religion. What happened next? The king says, he's never been denied this sort of offer before, so he's, he goes on to say, all right, you can marry my daughter. However, or more, moreover, you can also have half of my kingdom. You can have half of everything I own. And the Roman kingdom was huge at this time. You can have half of everything I own, half of this kingdom, and you can marry my daughter. However, you have to get rid of your religion. Abdullah bin Hudhava says no. So the king is perplexed. These people, these rulers, all they fight, fight for is the, is, are things in this world, things in this dunya. So he, he's never experienced somebody who is denying his offer like this before. So he's perplexed. He says, okay, bring one of his companions in the war. So he brings one of Abdullah and Hud Ibn Hudhafa's uh, companions before him, and, he sa and they get this cauldron. They get this pot, and they fill it up with oil, and they begin to boil the oil until it's very hot. And forgive me for the graphic imagery, but they took Abdullah's friend and threw him into the pot. And subhanAllah, he was melted so quickly, his bones, you could see it surfaced from the pot. Now, he says, the, the king says, okay, give up your religion or I'll kill you. Abdullah bin Hudhafa says, no, I'm not. So the king says, okay, kill him. He orders his guards to kill him. And the guards begin to pick him up and carry him to the pot. And Abdullah begins to cry. The king says, ah, I finally found fear within him. Stop, stop, stop. Why is it that you cry? Why are you, why are you crying? Is it because you're leaving your wife behind? You're leaving a widow behind? Is it because you're leaving your children behind, your family? Is it because you're leaving your land behind, all your treasure, your, your wealth? Abdullah bin Hudafa says, no, don't, don't mistake me. He says, the only reason I cry is because I do not have the chance to die this death as a shaheed 100 times. That I, do not have the, that, I, that I do not have 100 souls so that I can repeat this death over and over and over again so I can return to Allah. In this, type, in this time, Abdullah had every reason to be hopeless, but what did he do? He remembered Allah. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ, after the year of sadness, he had to face so many more trials. Five out of six of his children dying within his lifetime, crippling sickness, many loved ones dying in wars, the death of spouses, rejection from communities, loneliness. You guys may be thinking, you know, He's a prophet. I'll never be on his level anyway. What's the, what's the point? That's hopelessness, right, that's hopelessness right there. You guys might be thinking, you know, I'll never be on the prophet's level. So what's the point? You know, I, I, I'm not going to be on his level. I can't do that. No, that's not the point. The point is that when he was hopeless, he found Allah. Inshallah, in the next khutbah, we're going to go over how we can do that. Inshallah. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسانيري مسلمين فاستغفره إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. So, where I left off. How do we build this understanding that we need to dust ourselves off and come closer to Allah? Well, I have the perfect example for you all. What better person to learn how we can become closer to Allah to than the person who spoke to Allah himself, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was not the only person who had the chance to speak to Allah. It was also Musa. In Surah, in surah Taha, Ayahs 12 through 14, in the English translation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Musa, Indeed, I am your Lord, so remove your sandals. Indeed, you are in the sacred valley of Tuwa. And I have chosen you, so listen to what is revealed to you. Indeed, I am Allah. There is no deity except for me, so worship me and establish prayer for my remembrance. This comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. What did he say? From Allah himself, the most powerful deed is simply remembrance of Allah. Simple. Now, I want to give you guys a test. If you want to know how close you are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right now, 
If you want to know how close you are, what your standing is with him, how close you are to him, you have to check one thing. How close is he to you? How close is he to you? Lastly, okay, so let's say you didn't receive the answer you wanted from that test. How do we become closer to Allah? I keep saying go closer to Allah. How do we do that? We can also take an example from the same story. Now, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell Musa to do before Musa talked to him? He tells him to remove his sandals, right? What do we know about shoes? They're dirty. They're trodden. They have the gunk from the outside world. You remove them before coming into the masjid. You take your shoes off so you can approach who? Allah. You take your shoes off. They're dirty. They, they're, they're, they have the poisons. So what is the hikmah behind this? What is the story behind this? Simple. The message is, if you want to come closer to Allah, you have to remove the gunk from your life, the dirt from your life, the sins from your life. If you do this, you will see yourself become closer to Allah before you realize it. You won't even realize it, subhanAllah. You just have to stop a bad habit here. Take steps to just stop these bad habits and sins, and you'll notice yourself becoming closer to Allah. Are you yelling at your parents? Do you backbite about people when they're not around? Do you deliberately skip prayers? Do you do things when people aren't around that you don't want anybody else to know about? Now I leave you all with this. And I'm sure you all know the quote, uh, love is, I'm sorry, I'm going a little bit over time. I'm sure you guys know the quote, love is blind, right? What do you guys think when you hear this quote? You think about some youngster, you think about some kid who's uh, in love with somebody of the, you know, the opposite gender and they're doing dumb things because they're blind. Love blinds them, right? But guess what? This same quote works for Allah. If you, if you love Allah, if you truly love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it makes you blind. But what does it make you blind to? It makes you blind to sin. So, from this khutbah, many of us are hopeless. We all need to find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from removing sin from ourselves. That is the message that I want you all to take. And why am I giving you this reminder now? Because what better time to do this than the holy month of Ramadan? Easy. That's the best time for us. That's when we're all on our emotional highs. Take this time. Capitalize on it. Take this time to remove the sins from your life. Now, Earlier in the khutbah, I mentioned that there are uh, brothers and sisters who are thirsty around the world. There's actually a severe drought right now in Africa, in many countries in Africa. Do not be hopeless. There are things that we can do. There's actually a table downstairs for helping hand relief and development. We can all do our part to stop this. We can all do our part to help our brothers and sisters who haven't drank anything. SubhanAllah. We can all do our part. And as a matter of fact, there will be a fundraiser, inshallah, next Friday on May 19th uh, at 6.30 p.m., inshallah. Please visit the table outside, inshallah, so you can get some more information. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who are able to find him during this blessed month of Ramadan. May Allah make us from those who remove the dirt from ourselves so he can enter our hearts and we can do good. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitate ease for all of our brothers and sisters around the globe who are all losing hope. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا ذاب النار اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد اللهم صل على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وقيم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح وقد قامت الصلاة وقد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله please 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 silent your cell phones brothers and sisters let us not Get in the way of other people's prayer. Inshallah. Please pray as this is your final salah. Allahu Akbar.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغتوم عليهم ولا الضالين قل أعوذ برب الفلق من شر ما خلق ومن شر غسق إذا وقب ومن شر النفاثات في الأقد ومن شر حسد إذا حسد الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين قل أعوذ برب الناس ملك الناس إله الناس من شر الوسواس الخناس الذي يوسوس في صدور الناس من الجنة والناس الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة 